the World Association of Sleep Medicine and is a recurring presenter, Dr. Singh. Thank you very much and uh, good evening everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight. I want to uh, thank uh, Space Maintainers Lab uh, for hosting this webinar and uh, we'll talk a little bit about pneumopedics and craniofacial epigenetics and this is being applied to sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea in uh, mild, moderate and even severe cases. Um, so uh, we are based here in uh, Oregon, we're just uh, west of Portland, we're in Beaverton and uh, if you're in this part of the country feel free to visit, visit us, it's a gorgeous part uh, to, to come especially during the summer and uh, yeah, we, so we've been in this office for about a year or so and uh, we'd love to see you here one day. Um, as mentioned, I was a speaker at the World Association of Sleep Medicine, that was about a year ago and I've just returned from Denver, Colorado where the dental sleep medicine and the medical sleep meetings were held this year. I just got back uh, yesterday, last night. We presented a total of three papers which were very well received and if we're lucky, uh, I may be a speaker at that meeting next year as well as the World Association um, uh, in 2017. And uh, so uh, I'm currently CEO, Chairman of Bang Ordering Solutions, um, so I have shares in the company here. Uh, we have intellectual property, property. the uh, patents are all listed here, there's a few more besides that. And uh, we are FDA um, registered, we're FDA approved, we're FDA cleared. And what I mean by that is the company is FDA registered as a medical facility. All the devices are FDA registered and the mRNA appliance is FDA cleared for mild to moderate sleep apnea. And so yeah, uh, let's just uh, have a look here. And tonight we're going to be looking at the principles of craniofacial epigenetics, which includes epigenetic orthopedics as well as epigenetic orthodontics. I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll talk about pneumopedics. So orthodontics is moving bone, sorry, orthodontics is moving teeth, and uh, orthopedics is remodeling bone, and pneumopedics is remodeling the airway. And that's done non-surgically, and we do that by using biomedic oral appliances. Now there's lots of appliances out there, and so the way that these devices work is through biomedics. And so what you and I were saying is that uh, there's an interaction between the craniofacial morphology and the upper airway. So we're going to target the craniofacial region and we're going to improve the health of the upper airway. So tonight's uh, webinar is about applying these concepts as a potential cure for sleep apnea in a multidisciplinary dental setting. And this is what makes it different is that if we're lucky, after a period of about two years or so, this patient uh, will be sleeping with no device in their mouth and no mask on their face and uh, the sleep apnea should be in the control. So this is the medical model in the dental office. So classically we get you a medical director and uh, you will work with him or her to um, manage this uh, medical condition of sleep apnea. Um, so does anyone have a bulldog? Uh, we know that there are two mammals that classically snore. One of those is the bulldog and one of them is humans. And so if you look at this guy from the side view, here's the, uh, the mandible of this uh, bulldog and uh, it looks pretty big to me. And yet we know that this bulldog uh, has the condition of snoring. So here's my question, is that do I need mandibular advancement? So if we're saying that mandibular advancement is the uh, way of treating sleep apnea, the question is what do you do with patients with a class 3 malocclusion? The patients who already have mandibular prognathism, are you going to put the mandible, where are you going to put the mandible? And so then the question arises is, can I change this phenotype non-surgically? So now we have a class 1 phenotype and a class 3 phenotype. Can I change one so it looks like the other and can I do it non-surgically? 
And so really the question is, can I do it epigenetically? So um, that's the question we're going to be addressing. Now sleep apnea, apart from craniofacial anomalies, is also associated with, with the obesity. So here's this fat mouse from New Zealand, and when it's sleeping, it stands upright, and that way it keeps its airway open. So this is positional therapy. So then people lie on their back, they lie on their tummy, they lie on their side to keep their airway open, particularly if they have obesity. And so we have to think about the diagnostic reasons why does this patient have sleep apnea, and how can we best manage it, and how can we best correct it. Now, fat is deposited all over the body for these obese patients, including the tongue. So in this obese patient here, you can see how much fat has been deposited. And of course, a big tongue is going to obstruct the oropharynx. The thing to remember is that this is craniofacial, and so there could be other sites of obstruction, and there could be other reasons why the patient has sleep apnea. So we have to look at both the craniofacial size and the obesity to find out what is the effect on the upper airway. So here's a normal patient with the normal amount of uh, fat and soft tissue, normal uh, bone size, and the normal airway size. But here's a patient who's obese. The bone is a regular size, but the tissue pressure is causing the airway collapse. This patient here is non-obese, a normal amount of soft tissue, but they have a smaller maxilla and a smaller mandible, and so it's the same effect, the tissue pressure is going to cause airway collapse. So this shows us that we need to look at the craniofacial region very carefully to find out where is the sleep apnea coming from. Is it coming from the soft tissues? Is it coming from the hard tissues? What is the impact on the airway? And the other big question is, what about the teeth? Are teeth involved in any way in the risk of developing sleep apnea and what effect it has on the severity of sleep apnea? So we know that some people will extract third molars. We know that some people will extract premolars. And so we need to look at the teeth to find out really how do they contribute to sleep apnea in our patients. Now, the approach we're going to be taking is what you might call an epigenetic approach. So epigenetics is a relatively new uh, science. There's a huge amount of research on epigenetics. It's in the news. You've probably heard about it. And the interesting thing here is that we're looking at phenotypic changes. We're changing the phenotype without altering the DNA sequence. So we're not changing the genes, but we are um, altering the environment in which those genes find themselves, and that changes the pattern of gene expression. Now, those changes here are mediated by these attachment of chemical groups of DNA, its proteins, its histones, and chromatin. So the genes are surrounded by this epigenome, this kind of local environment, and the local environment is biochemically reactive. And so we can get epigenetic modification, and all of these are biochemical reactions that can occur. Ravelization, acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, simulation, and ubiquination. And we've been doing these types of modifications for the past century, maybe more, without really knowing what we were doing. So an example here is methylation. So we know that women of childbearing age we usually recommend a folate supplement to the diet prior to and during pregnancy. And what a folate does, it's a methyl donor. So this is an example of methylation, and that produces a healthy neural tube. And the healthy neural tube prevents health issues such as spina bifida, cleft palate, so on and so forth. So, um, Here's a, another a paper that came out recently, which is looking at the idea of the human genome. And here's a bunch of scientists here, 200 scientists, working on this project to understand the system of switches that regulate genes. Genes can be upregulated, downregulated, they can be switched off, 
they can be modulated. And so what we want to do by doing this study to map the human genome is find new ways to treat or cure diseases. And one of those would be sleep apnea. So what we've done in the past is saying that we can manage the condition over a patient's lifetime, either with a CPAP or with a mandibular advancement device. But there may be a possibility to get a possible cure for some of these patients using an epigenetic approach. So we're using biomedic appliances. What do you mean by biomedics or biomimicry? Well, basically, you've got to copy nature. These are little fish, and they're going to alter the behavior of the big fish, and so the big fish are going to be caught because you're mimicking nature. And so biomimetics is a science. It studies natural models and uses designs and processes to solve human problems. So you have to think about the natural model. What is the natural model for the human? The modern human is pretty symmetrical on the outside, um, but on the inside, in the chest, in the thorax, in the abdomen, you get asymmetry. The natural model for the modern human is to have 32 teeth. Two eyes, 10 fingers, all of these are genetically encoded. And so the idea is to replicate nature and produce a model that has withstood the test of time, and that includes 32 teeth in the patient's mouth. Now, how are we going to do that? How are we going to mimic the natural model? Well, we'll use processes, we'll use developmental processes, and the great thing about these developmental processes is that they are encoded by genes. Those are the genes that you inherited, the genes you were born with, the genes that you keep for life. So the idea is to use your own genetic potential to heal yourself and to produce a better outcome. And so you see here, this is an ax that's been redesigned mimicking the way that a woodpecker actually removes wood. It's a more efficient design by following the natural model. And so humans have a natural design. It's encoded by genes. And so our idea is to maximize and optimize that natural pattern the best we can. So what do you mean by cranial facial epigenetics being a bit more focused on our region of interest? Brain facial genetics use a person's natural genes and they correct straight the jaws, the teeth, the top of the spaces. We do that painlessly using biomedic appliances. And so again, the emphasis here is on natural genes. This is not GMO, this is not transgenics, there's no artificial gene transfer, it's your own genes, it's your own genetic potential. And so because of that, some patients respond really well, really fast. And others take a little bit longer. And so it's difficult to predict. It's like saying to 10 children, run 100 yards. You know, one guy finishes first. And it's difficult to predict which of those kids would have been the best runner if you just looked at them. And so similarly, some patients respond really fast, really well. And sometimes they take longer, but everyone gets there in the end. Now, the idea here is that we're going to be using a pain-free system. And we know that when braces are uh, placed on a person's teeth, they get a pain response. And that's because the, the, the forces from the braces are exerting, you know, force on the teeth, which then leads to inflammation, and then you get pain. So basically, the teeth were in a healthy uh, condition, and then what happened is that the braces were placed and the inflammatory reaction occurred. Well, what we know is that inflammation is not good for the body. Now, you know, the, the evidence shows that teeth are moved, the bone remodels when you apply a force. But when a child is developing teeth, erupting teeth naturally, typically there's no pain. And so what that tells us is the body has its own natural way of moving teeth it's actually a circadian rhythm, and so that is the developmental process that we are trying to mimic, that we're trying to copy. So we can talk about um, epigenetic orthodontics, tooth movement, cosmetic treatment with health benefits, but that's possible if we have epigenetic orthopedics, 
which involves bone formation and bone remodeling. So this is kind of new. What we're saying here is that we can actually make bone in adult patients. We actually increase the bone volume. So when you get a larger amount of bone, the bone can then be remodeled to make a better version of the same thing, a bigger version of the maxilla, a better version of the mandible. And as you do that, you get the pneumopedic effect, which is a non-surgical upper airway remodeling. So if you increase the bone volume, the upper airway volume seems to follow that. And we've known that for centuries as a process called pneumatization. So we'll come to that in a few moments. Now, what makes craniofacial epigenetics different from traditional orthodontics? Well, this is a kind of a slightly higher uh, kind of aim. And we're looking at the overall health of the craniofacial region. The craniofacial means brain health, TMJ health, dental health, airway health. And so we want the whole craniofacial region to be healthy. And we're going to use protocols that I mean to address the underlying etiology of the signs and symptoms. So the question is not how am I going to treat this patient? The question is why does this patient have sleep apnea? Why does this patient have uh, TMJ problems and uh, dysfunction? Why does this patient have a malocclusion? If we can unravel the why, it will lead us to the answer of how we're going to treat our patient. Here's another question, what makes pneumopedics different from mandibular advancement devices? Is it the same or is it different? Well, here's an example of a patient that uh, was uh, referred to us, and this uh, gentleman had been wearing a mandibular advancement device for about five years. And you can see that now he has an anterior open bite. Sometimes he will develop a, a posterior open bite. Some people get uh, jaw pain and TMJ problems. Some people um, get tooth, unwanted tooth movements. So the idea is to try to mimic the natural model so that we can prevent things from getting worse. Remember the principle of medicine is first, do no harm. Number two, make no assumptions. Number three, be better than placebo. So it needs to be statistically significant. So here's a patient that we treated over about five years. And, you know, this is a, these are two different patients, but you can see that those teeth are in a reasonable position, and we have a healthy and happy functional unit there for this particular patient. So that's the difference between what we do and some of the devices that are currently available. Where do these concepts arise? Where do they come from? Well, originally, I was working in the Center for Craniofacial Disorders, looking at children and babies with craniofacial anomalies, such as cleft lip, cleft palate, and some of the craniofacial syndromes, such as APERT and Crusoe syndrome. And so what we see here is uh, a child who was surgically treated for cleft lip and palate. You see that his mid face didn't grow very well. So we did distraction osteogenesis, and we brought his mid face forwards. That's a well-known technique. Now, if you look at his uh, MRI scan, I mean, in those days, we didn't have the 3D Calvin studies at MRI, you can see the degree of bone deficiency. He has a deficient mid-face. He's got maxillary hypoplasia, okay? And then we see him after the distraction and how the bone volume here has increased, the shape and the size of the bone has increased here. But the real crazy thing is that the surgery was done back here. And so the question we have to ask is, what made this piece of bone change up front whereby the surgery was done on the back? So what the distraction did, it changed the position of the maxilla, of the mid-face, in space. And when the, when the maxilla changed its position, the remodeling process came in and produced a better version of the same thing. So that's what happens to the bone volume. And then we looked at a series of teenagers who had the same procedure. They had mid-facial distraction osteogenesis done. And then we did a study to look at what changed. The red means it got bigger. So we see that the facial profile improved. We see that the mid-facial bone volume increased as expected. But then we see a red area right about here. And that, of course, is the upper airway. 
Now remember that these teenagers, the only thing that they had was a mid-facial surgical procedure. And so now my idea is, can I achieve this result, or a similar result, non-surgically? So if I could make the mid-face grow and develop non-surgically, I could target the airway behind it. So I had that idea about 10 years ago. This is a work going back to 2006. And so if we fast forward, the bottom line is probably yes. And the interesting thing is that we can do this in adult patients. So now it becomes an epigenetic phenomenon in the way we approach these people. So let's have a look at the ideas behind how you would start treating a patient, an adult patient, using this idea. And so what I wrote is the spatial major hypothesis published at the University of Michigan in 2004. And what it says is that during development, during growth and development, the spatial and functional alignment of the skeletal elements is maintained through modeling of bony surfaces. So as this child is growing, as they're developing, the upper jaw and the lower jaw, they're being remodeled because the teeth are erupting, that includes the periodontium, to permit functions such as biting and talking and sleeping and breathing. So we know that the bone is being remodeled at the surfaces during growth and development. Now, what happens when these children are growing is that there are environmentally induced changes. They're environmentally induced. They could be genetic. That's how I started looking at the, the uh, cranial tissue anomalies. But most kids, they don't have a genetic problem. So these are environmentally induced changes, okay, which produce a change in the early morphological relationship. So what that means is the child is thumb sucking. The child is bottle feeding. The child is mouth breathing. The child uses a pacifier. All of these are environmentally induced changes. And what that does, it changes the phenotype. It changes the outcome. It produces a new solution. So now we've got phenotypic variation. So this child genetically had a class one occlusion, but because of the environmental impact, now it's going to increase overgen. Now it's got a class two or increased overbind, or an anterior crossbind. So this is known as a phenotypic variation. It's a new, a new solution. Now, the interesting thing is this new solution represents a departure from the genetically encoded body plan. The body plan was expecting a class one occlusion for these, uh, for these growing children. And the class one occlusion is a result of temporospatial patterning. So at a certain time, at a certain place, genes are expressed, and what they will do is try to promote a class one type of outcome. But this child's been thumb sucking, and now you've got this class two, and so there's a departure away from the genetically encoded body plan. So what happens is a thing called developmental compensation. Let's just go back on step. Let's say you are driving uh, from Los Angeles um, to Vegas, and you don't drive on the freeway, and it says turn left, and your GPS system is saying turn left, and what you do is you turn right. Well, what the GPS system does, it recalculates and says, hey, do a U-turn, and come all the way back, and then carry forward from there. So the body is a little bit like that. It's comparing what we have with what was expected. It will recalculate it for you. And that recalculation is called developmental compensation. The developmental compensation permits compromised function. So you were driving from Los Angeles to Vegas. You took a wrong turn. It took you a little bit longer to get to Vegas. And so in this example here, because of the developmental compensation, you end up with a compromised function. You can eat, but your, che your teeth are crooked. You can chew, but you get jaw pain. You can breathe, but you're snoring at night. So what this represents is compromised function. It's not ideal. It's not optimal. It's the best solution I can give you in the conditions that I had to work with at that time. So now what are you going to do? You can do the opposite. You will decompensate. 
and you decompensate through appropriate spatial signaling. So in other words, if the mandible is retruded, you'll bring it forward. If it's off the midline, you bring it towards the center. And what that does is that it helps to reestablish the genomic pattern formation for the optimal form and the optimal function. It's like you're back on the right track, you're back on the freeway again, you've got some kind of uh, time to catch up, and eventually you can get to the point where you are optimized for both function and form. So that paper that I mentioned was written uh, a few years ago, about 10 years ago. And what we have here is a paper that came out very recently, as early as, as, early as 2015. February 2015, this paper just came out. And so this is a very interesting paper. It says, Mind the Gap, Genetic Manipulation of Basic Cranial Growth with the synchondrosis modulates calvarial and facial shape in mice through epigenetic interactions. Interesting paper. It's saying that, that when you start manipulating the cranial base in these mice, you start to change the face, the shape of the face, and that is an epigenetic interaction or epigenetic phenomenon. The first three words are going to be interesting, mind the gap. What gap are they talking about? Well. The way we were originally taught, we were taught that uh, the phenotype is determined by genes. So that's a genomic thesis. And what we're saying here is we can change the phenotype epigenetically. And so now what we have is the epigenetic antithesis. So there's a gap in thinking or a gap in uh, understanding. And so we have the, the gap is between the genomic thesis and the epigenetic synthesis. And what we're going to do is the resolving synthesis. We're going to take those two things and make them work for us clinically. And the example we have is sleep apnea. So um, sleep apnea is about the airway. I want to remodel the airway. And the way I'm going to do that is through pneumopedics. So we said that orthodontics is moving teeth and orthopedics is remodeling bone, and pneumopedics is remodeling the upper airway, and it's non-surgical, and no drugs are involved. So here it is, pneumopedics is a non-surgical process of upper airway remodeling. We're going to trim the biomedical appliance, and an appliance that tries to mimic nature. And how does it work? The principles of epigenetics can activate a person's naturally occurring genes and start to correct deficiencies in the cranial facial region. The tissues are slowly redeveloped and remodeled over a period of time, and it corrects the upper airway. It's an non-surgical, it's pain-free. There's no drugs, medication, or injections. So what happens during that new period process is that the cranial facial region undergoes these structural changes. The functional space of the upper airway increases at volumetrically. So you get a volumetric increase in the size and the change in the shape of the upper airway. And that gives you improved basic functions and physiologic processes such as breathing during sleep. So now you're breathing and sleeping at a higher level of quality. So this is the reason we use these biomedical appliances to treat, reduce, and eventually eliminate sleep apnea. And so there is a possibility that we can start to get some of these patients off of a device long term if they respond the way that we want them to. So before we start treating patients, we need to know what is the dental arch morphology in adults with OSA. And everyone's been looking at the mandible, which is fine, but going back a few years, which is going back 2008-2009, I'm looking at the mid-phase based on my previous research. So we look at the upper arch in patients with sleep apnea, and what we find is the upper arch is narrower between 7 to 11 percent in the OSA cases compared to the controls. The mandible is also smaller as expected. Now the interesting thing here is the direction in which the narrowing occurs. So we see this color-coded here, this kind of pseudo-circular scale. 
Violet or purple means it's in the AP sagittal direction. The blue or the red is 45 degrees. And so what we see is concentric collapse of the midface. It needs both anterior, posterior, and transverse, and vertical correction. And so this brings us to midfacial redevelopment. It's different from partial expansion. Transverse partial expansion is in children. It splits the suture. You get a diastema. You get bone loss, and you get pain. So we don't want to use rapid partial expansion, particularly not in adults. And so what we do is a biomimetic uh, procedure to redevelop the midface in 3D, increase the bone volume, and target the upper airway. So here's a young lady here who came for uh, an appointment. And her main concern is not the fact that her teeth have relapsed. She was an orthodontic case. You can see the premolars were extracted when she was young. As a teenager, she had straight teeth. But now as 45 year old um, person, her main concern now is she's been diagnosed with sleep apnea. So what we're going to do, well, we need the functional space. And so I'm going to recapture the premolar spaces, increase the bone volume, give a space where the tongue can be accommodated, and that would keep the airway open, and we can realign uh, those teeth at a later point as required. So, different case, here's a 38-year-old adult male diagnosed with moderate sleep apnea. This is the first case that we did back in 2011. Again, similarly, the premolars have been extracted for orthodontic reasons, and now took about uh, 10 months to increase his midfacial bone volume. You see the spacing in here is because the bone has increased in size. And so, he didn't want to have implants, and so we haven't localized it to the premolar region. We'll do veneers and close the spaces at the end. So if teeth are missing and the bone starts to grow, that's when you start to get little spaces appearing. And you need to warn your patient, plan for those spaces ahead of time so there's no surprises, and make a, a pretty comprehensive treatment plan so then you know how you're going to finish that patient uh, towards the end of the treatment uh, time. So this is the same patient. You can see his upper airway. Um, this is 15 months uh, of imaging. So we gave him a lot of time to kind of recover from the active treatment. And then we did the uh, combium at the end. And there's a significant increase in the airway volume from 12.8 to 22 cc's. Now this is an adult male. And so if you look at his airway, from the lateral view, you see kind of pretty small looking airway here. And here it's looking a lot larger. And then we're going to look at the apnea hypopnea index. And as you know, apnea is when you stop breathing, and hypopnea is when you get desaturation and flow limitation. And here's apnea hypopnea index. You can see at the front here how the airway was obstructed, the volume increased. The AHI decreased from 24 down to about 3. That took about a year. And remember that he's wearing no device in his mouth when the sleep study is done. So here's a possible way of helping these patients actually to increase their airway volume, get rid of the sleep apnea. And so we can do this for adult patients. Here's his teeth at the end of uh, the treatment. They were very nice veneers were done here by Dr. Wendling. And you can see that he's looking like a healthier and happier patient. You can see his head posture has also actually improved. So this uh, enhanced craniofacial homeostasis, the soft tissues, the hard tissues, the bone, and the functional spaces, that is what our aim is to correct all of those tissues. This is a paper that came out in 2013 and written by some different authors. And what they said is that studies show evidence of can be measured anatomic airway changes with surgery and dental appliance treatment. The dental appliance that they're referring to is a case I've just shown you. So we were the first people to show that you can redevelop the, the airway and uh, possibly eliminate sleep apnea um, using this biomedic uh, approach. Here's a different patient here. 
She's been going to the dentist uh, for her hygiene appointments. She sat there with a device to sleep at night. She was concerned about her wrinkles on her face here. And after about 12 months or so, she looks like a happier, and a healthier young lady. The kind of face is more relaxed. She seems kind of re rejuvenated. And so if you look at this uh, case, the upper, uh, the upper arch improved a little bit. The teeth got slightly better aligned. The lower teeth, you can see they became better aligned. But look at the position of the tongue. You see how asymmetric it is, flying back in the mouth. And after about uh, 12 months or so, the tongue is coming forward. It's more symmetric in shape. So we've got facial changes. We've got dental changes. We've got soft tissue changes. And here is the hard tissue change. The gray is pre-treatment, and the blue is post-treatment. And so we can see that's kind of blue on this side, which means that the bone volume increased on the right side and not so much on the left. And the mandible moves into that new area. So why did it change mostly on the right side? We look at her face here, and we see that the obstruction on her nose is mostly on her right side. And so the bone is modeled symmetrically. She can now breathe through the right side of her nose. And if the bone volume increased, we expect the airway volume to increase. Look at the same patient. Her airway volume at the beginning was 17 cc's. You can see the obstruction was right about here. And here she is after about 18 months. And you can see that the airway volume has increased to 28 cc's. This is a pneumopedic effect. There's no appliance in this patient's mouth, and yet the airway has increased in size. This is a different patient. This is a 60-year-old adult male, treated for about 18 months or so. The red is his airway before treatment, side view and the front view. And here he is after 18 months or so. You can see that the airway volume has doubled in size, more than doubled in size. No surgery. No drugs, no injection, no pain. You start to remodel that airway over a period of time. Now, some people are concerned that you might get space between the teeth, but if you go at a nice physiologic rate, the bone volume starts to get wider, but the teeth stay in contact. That's a biomedic change. And so we can actually measure to find out was an increased bone volume or bone width in these adult patients. We're going to measure the bone width to see did it get wider or did the teeth just tip. If you measure the bone volume to show the bone width here, it increased from about 33 to about 35 on average, statistically significant. And actually, we got uh, a little prize for showing that the bone volume increases from about 14 to about 15 cc's in this particular case. And if you look at the study, we've got a little price for this. And if you look at the study of bone volume, you can see that the bone volume increased from about 17 to 19 cc's on average. Statistically significant. So about two cc's of bone are being produced in these adult patients without doing surgery. Now, our friends over in Europe, they did the same study, but they did surgical expansion of the maxilla. So remember what our study showed, that the bone got wider and the bone volume increased. That's what we found. So what did these guys find? They found the same thing. They found that the positive distances in the right and left posterior alveolar regions indicated lateral expansion. So the bone got wider in the surgical cases. Same with us. But what they found was they got anterior um, maxillary retrusion. There was negative distances, posterior displacement and remodeling of the anterior alveolar segment. So there's a difference between what we do and other techniques because we do not want to get anterior retraction of the mid face. So you can see in this uh, European study, it got wider, but the anterior segment actually got smaller. Now, here's a case uh, who was referred to us, and he's been told that he's a surgical case. He's 24 years old, and you can see that he's got a relatively large mandible, and he's got this anterior crossbite, 
And if you look into orally, anterior cross bite, posterior cross bite on both sides. And he's been told he's a surgical case because he's 24 years old. And so we're going to treat him non-surgically for about two years. And what we see there is improved mid-facial bone volume. And uh, he's a happier and healthier patient with a nice looking facial profile. So this is not a surgical case because of the anterior retraction. So we, we did it non-surgically to get a better outcome. This is a different patient. We superimpose a pre and post treatment um, cambium scans here. Starting intermolar width was a 31.5, and towards the end of the treatment, it increased about 35 millimeters. And so the airway is going to change at the same time. The airway was pretty narrow at the beginning, and now it's increased about double the size, approximately. So what we saw in this patient is the jaw got wider and that the airway improved, and this is a pneumopedic effect. Here's the study models from that same case, and they got wider. And this is the same patient. Here she is pre-treatment. We see kind of a gummy smile. We see kind of in a rounded face, a bit of a double chin maybe. And then here she is after about two years. And again, no braces, uh, no surgery. The only thing she used was the biomedic device as prescribed. Different patient, different dentist. If you superimpose the comb beam scans pre and post treatment, pre treatment it was 8.5 and 9.5, and post treatment increased by 13 and to about 12. You can actually see how the mandible, here is the mandible pre treatment, and here it is post treatment. So the mandible actually came forwards, the teeth are slightly proclined into the lower lip here. So what we did is read out the mid face and give the mandible some functional space to actually move into. Different patient, different dentist, same result. The upper airway volume here, 11.8 to begin with, surface area 141, and now it's gone to 27 and 379. Remember, no device in the patient's mouth when the sleep study is done, no device in the patient's mouth when the 3D comb beams are taken. Now, if you can increase the mid-facial bone volume, what happens to the nasal cavity width and what happens to the nasal cavity volume? So here's a case study, a 12-year-old girl, she's got rhinitis, she's got sleep disorder breathing, she's a mouth breather, she's not doing well in school. And she's got kind of adenoid faces, the, uh, slightly out of focus, I've got to apologize. But after two years, she's looking a lot nicer. See a rolled lip here, a bit of a mouth breather. Now the mouth is closed, the lips are sealed, she breathes just fine. Forehead posture improved. Look at the adenoids here. Okay, that's where the obstruction is. And so non surgically, we're able to reduce the adenoids down. So that area here has improved dramatically, and all this obstruction that she had here has been resolved. And on the panel, you can see a little bit of nasal obstruction here and here. And then post-treatment, if you very carefully, you can see some kind of black areas where the air is looking a lot better. You see the teeth are coming into, into position, the molar teeth. And you can see her anterior cross bite pre-treatment. And then post-treatment, you see the anterior cross bite has been corrected. The crowding has been corrected, and she has pretty decent uh, occlusion when she's finished treatment with no braces in this case. So first treatment, she's breathing better, she's sleeping better, she's not a mouth breather, she breathes through her nose. She's doing better in school, and her rhinitis and her allergies have been improved. So that was a, uh, an, a pediatric case, here's a different case here. Wearing the device for about a year, you see the mandible starts to develop, the mid face starts to develop. Now we're going to measure the distance between the nasal septum and the inferior concha. And we can see here how we increase from 0 0.1, this obstruction is here, that's increased to about 
And the adult cases, you're in for 1.7, 1.2, as of 2.5 and 3.2. So that's the functional space you need for nasal breathing. And here's another case here. The intermolar width increased from 37 to about 40. And you can see that the nasal airway has improved. So you're converting this patient into becoming a nasal breather as opposed to being a mouth breather. So if you look at the structure of the nose, it's pretty intimate. Here's a um, paper that we did back in 1998 showing the antenate process, a little piece of bone here. And what that does, it directs airflow through the nose. And patients with uh, rhinitis, they've got a more large repetition the antenate process as a piece of bone here. And so here's that piece of bone, there it is. And what it's doing, as the air goes through the nose, it protects the sinus from the external air. And so the job is to isolate the sinus from the nasal airflow. And the job of the sinuses is to produce and store high concentrations of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, as we know, is a uh, antimicrobial, stimulates ciliary activity, clearance of the sinus, but also it's a small vessel dilator. So when the air goes in, picks up the nitric oxide from the sinuses, delivers it to the pulmonary alveoli, and you get good, good gas exchange in the lungs. But if you uh, remove this antenate process surgically, you start getting contamination of the sinuses by the inspired air, and you end up with a thing called nasal collapse. And so we want to prevent the nose, we want to preserve the nasal architecture, and we want to prevent it from collapsing in these patients. So look at the, uh, some of these patients who had the nasal surgery. At the end of the nasal collapse, you have ostera wide open, but they are completely dysfunctional. So we have to, pre we have to preserve the, the form and the function of the nasal architecture. And the way we do that is wearing a device inside the mouth, the floor, the roof of the mouth is the floor of the mouth. So it's the same bound that we're going to be remodeling. So let's do a study to find out what happens with the nasal cavity volume in adult patients using this biomedic approach. The patients were about 38 years old, it's like about 18 months of treatment. We can reconstruct the nose in 3D. And so here we have the nasal cavity volume, this area here. We're going to measure this volume in these patients pre-treatment and post-treatment. They do some statistical tests to see what happened. Look at this guy's nose before treatment, a little bit asymmetric, a little bit narrow. And here he is. He's got the improved nasal symmetry and so improve nasal airflow into the nose there. But what about the space? What about the functional space? Did it actually increase inside the nose? On average, it went up from 39.8 to about 42. That's about two cc's of nasal volume. Actually, we got a small price for this last year, I'll do it before. Now, our colleagues in Europe did the same study, but they did it surgically. So they're gonna do surgical Partial expansion, okay? And it took them 22 months on average. Then after the surgery, they put a Hybrax appliance into the patient's mouth. And what they found is that the nasal volume increased about 9.7%. So here's what they did. They did an osteotomy, LaFour 1. They did a mid end osteotomy, and they did a pterygo maxillary disjunction under general anesthesia. So they took the bone here and they split it uh, down the middle, at the back here, and also up top. And then they put a hyrax appliance in or a tissue bond distractor. And the patient wore this device um, for about 22 months. And you can see post-treatment that the bone got wider. The problem is of this diastema at the end of treatment. So let's look at the example here. You, this is a post-treatment case using a non-surgical technique, pre-treatment and post-treatment. These are two different cases. But there's no diastema here compared to this guy. There's no diastema here. No diastema, there's a big diastema here. So this is not a biomimetic 
uh, protocol is not copying the body, not supposed to have a huge diastema uh, in these patients. And that, of course, would have to be finished orthodontically. And when you try to close that space, you're going to probably close down the nasal airway. So if you look at the comparison of the surgical high ranks and the DNA appliance, um, they did three, a three-part surgery, and a Lafort osteotomy, middle osteotomy, and a pterygomycostomy. We did no surgery. The treatment time was 22 months. I was 18 on average. They wore the device 24-7 device after the surgery. This device is only one for 16 hours every day. Sample size is similar. The nasal volume increased by 9.7. I was increased by 5.6. The problem is they got a diastema formation, we got no diastema. So you have a, a choice. You can do it surgically or you can do it non-surgically. Now here's a patient from our study. She's an example of a non-surgical case. Narrow nostrils, malocclusion, and the thick neck shows that she has sleep apnea. And here she is after 18 months with no surgery, no drugs, no braces, and the pain-free procedure. So this is allowing her genetic potential to heal her body. So if you are able to increase the bone volume in adult patients, you increase the nasal cavity volume in patients, what would happen to patients with sleep apnea? So in this study, we're going to test to see what happens in patients with sleep apnea. Can we get them off the therapy? Can we get them off the CPAP therapy? So what we have here are patients with mild to moderate sleep apnea. The sleep home sleep study was interpreted by both certified sleep physician. It's a biomedical oral appliance with a dentist, Tara Griffin, uh, with advanced training in dental sleep medicine. We're going to look at the apnea hypotony index, pre and post treatment, with no appliance to the patient's mouth when the sleep studies are down. And on average, it went from 13 down to about 4. If you're less than five, it means you do not have sleep apnea. So some of these cases, three, two, one, three, two, some of these cases do no, not longer, no longer have sleep apnea with no device in the patient's mouth. And I presented this work at the World Association of Sleep Medicine last year, and it was very well received. And the paper was actually published um, last year as well. Remember, there's no device in the patient's mouth when the sleep studies are done. Now here's an example that shows mild and moderate cases. Here's an example of a patient with severe sleep apnea. The apnea hypotonic index is over 100, it's 100 or 518. And so we referred her to an ENT colleague who did the TNA, did the tonsillectomy, removed the tonsils. But after that, the AHI came down to 70-70. And so by definition, she still has sleep apnea. So they put her on a CPAP. She's 27 years old, she doesn't like the CPAP, and she wanted a different device. And so she found us out and said, could I get the device that we're offering? So she has severe sleep apnea. So we said, you must wear the CPAP during the therapy. And it took about nine months, and it combined with CPAP. And at the end of nine months, she's down to one AHI of one, without the CPAP and without the appliance in the patient's mouth. So look at her airway. Here's her tonsils. You can't see the soft palate. Here's her tongue. And here's her airway post-treatment. Now she's got a tube that she can actually breathe through. And the board-certified C physician, he said the nasal airflow was good quality, no significant disturbance. This patient no longer has sleep apnea with or without the device in the patient's mouth. And so it's possible for us, especially if we in a patient off a CPAP or off a mandibular enhancement device and get them healthy if uh, over a period of time. So that was a single patient. Here's a whole group of patients with severe sleep apnea. This guy went from 40 down to 3. This guy went from 41 down to 4. This one is uh, still refractory to therapy, this guy went down to five. And so you can see that on average, they went down from about 46 to about 16 and a half. Statistically significant, overall reduction of 
And remember, no device in the patient's mouth when the study is done. This is about halfway through treatment. They're not quite finished yet. So in conclusion, upper airway changes can be obtained in non-growing patients. It shows that uh, a suggests that a genetically modified or genetically encoded mechanism may be modulated by biomedic or appliances to enhance upper airway. And these findings are going to help dentists to manage patients with sleep apnea using a pneumopedic or a craniofacial epigenetic approach. So um, I just want to thank you for your attention today. Um, we are having these training events here in Beaverton, Oregon. The next one is on the end of July, 28th, 20th, and 30th of July here in Beaverton, Oregon. And then the new orthopedics part is going to be in August, and that's going to be in our offices too. So two events lined up for July and August. And remember that we are going to harness the power of genetics. Typically, each of the events is... Um, Kind of charge a fee of 3995 but if you get the bundle together you get a single payment of 5995 there's a significant cost reduction there and i know that some people are interested in getting on board with us so today if you're going to be registering for the july and august seminars these two here you'll get an additional 10 percent discount so you take 10 percent off that number if you are going to register for the July and August uh, events. Now, when you call us to do that, the, the promo code is SML, Space Maintainers Lab, SML. So when you call us, say, I went to the webinar, and then we'll give you a 10% discount for the July and August events. I want to thank you for your attention. A lot of the university hospitals are uh, getting very much on board with us and uh, the Departments of Sleep Medicine and Neurology in particular. And so um, we have a lot of uh, very strong interest from our medical colleagues. So I want to thank you for your attention. And there is time for a few questions, uh, if you wish. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh. If there are any questions, please ask now.